The Sweet 16 is set. The NFL owners meetings are underway in Orlando, and we are creeping closer to this year's draft. So much to get into as we welcome you into hour two of the Lombardi line presented by DraftKings. We're live on Beeson and DraftKings Network alongside three-time Super Bowl winning executive Michael Lombardi, Stormy Tony with you. And what a weekend it was in college hoops, Michael. We're, we're going to get to NFL here in a couple minutes, but with all of the amazing upset straight up that we had the first couple days in round one and then seeing the tides turn and chalk just taking over in round two it was a wild weekend it really was when it went on script and who would have thought that right who would have thought that the tournament if you put the one and two seeds into your sweet 16 Mm -hmm. and had eight of them there you would have looked like a genius like it's just we love the upsets right And then, of course, you know, we talk about the players transfer and Stormy. And now it comes out, you know, James Madison's Mark Byington. He's going to become the Vanderbilt head coach. Kyle Smith from Washington State is going to become the Stanford coach. Uh, Danny Springer from Utah State is going to become the Washington coach. All these teams (laughs) got beat, you know, in in the tournament. And the next day they're leaving. Like, how did you balance that? Like, I don't know how you do that. Like, it's hard. Couldn't you wait a day or two after you lost before you announce it and make it look like you were kind of pondering it? Kind of makes you wonder. Like, there should be a moratorium on this, yeah, right? Read the In room, the middle my of goodness. a tournament. Exactly. I and mean, yeah, Washington State's playing Iowa State, and you know you're going to become the next head coach at Stanford. You know, James Madison gets killed by Duke. Okay, I'm going to go over and take the Vanderbilt job now. Thank you very much. Like, seriously, what's going I mean, we complain about the players. But what role models are they using? Well, and I don't fault the coaches for taking better jobs. Granted, they deserve it. Can't we wait a little bit? I agree. It's a tough look. And then you add in insult to injury. You have Bill Self, who's asked after they get knocked out, uh, after Kansas gets knocked out, okay, now, like, do you start immediately thinking to next season? And he said, honestly, for the about the last month, I've been thinking ahead to next season. Things I would have <laughs> liked to know before that game. You know, that would have been beneficial, perhaps. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, that's my point about us being a betting network. Like, do you think anybody who would have thought Mark Bennington was going to leave James Madison for Vanderbilt yeah. would have put any money on James Madison? Of course not. Of course not. So now we have, as you referenced, the top one and two seeds. All of them advanced to the Sweet 16. First time since 2019, fifth time ever. In terms of the numbers straight up and against the spread for top four seeds in the tournament so far here, Michael, 26 and four straight up, 21 and nine against the spread, a tournament record. So things have certainly turned in favor of those those higher seeds, those better teams. Will that continue here in the Sweet 16? One team that I have a feeling it will, those freaking Yukon Huskies who are the favorite to repeat and win it all, be the first team to do so since 07. Yeah. They are an 11-point favorite, bet up from 9.5 at open against my Aztecs, and I have not a hope in the world for San Diego State because Yukon is a barrel right now. Yeah, they're, as, as Thomas Gable said in the last hour, they're playing their best, right? Their, their, their power rating is at an all-time high. And same with North Carolina State. I think that's kind of you got to look at this thing and you regroup again because – North Carolina State's playing the best basketball they've played all year. Gonzaga could be playing the best basketball they've played all year. Alabama might be playing the best, although they have moments of lapse that they've played all year. I know North Carolina against Michigan State with 10 minutes to go in the first half. They played the next 30 minutes, probably one of the best they've had all year. Duke is playing the best they've had all season. How about Arizona's dominance, right? So I think what makes this Sweet 16 so unique is – Eight of them are one and two seeds, Mm -hmm. but there's all these teams are playing at such a, at their best level, if you will, right? I don't think there's a team that limped in here. You know, I don't think there's a team that just got the seeding right and they got in. Even Illinois and even Tennessee, yeah, they struggled, but they were able to close those games out. Iowa State was a tough game. I mean, Iowa State went the first 10 minutes, didn't make a shot in the game. Are you just going to make a basket here or what? What are we going to (laughs) do? Sure. But I, I think that's what makes this Sweet 16 so. Interesting. I, I fully expect Thursday and Friday night the games are going to be great. Yeah, I, I'm with you. And as you go through the the games, it feels like San Diego State, UConn, and maybe Clemson, Arizona are kind of the only gimmies, which even still, like anything can happen on any given day. That's the beauty of this tournament. But 
Like those are the only like big spread gimmies and all of these other games feel like they're going to be closely contested, feel like they're going to be tough. To your point about Houston and Duke, I think that's going to be one of the funnest games. So cool. Wow. Even even Purdue, yeah. who has been dominant these first two games, they play Grambling and then they just blow out Utah State. But they're a five and a half point favorite against Gonzaga and Gonzaga on any given day could be awesome. So like I'm, I'm really, really looking forward yeah. to these games coming up. Um, we'll see if NC State can keep it rolling. They're the only double digit seed that is still remaining here. And yeah. I, men- I mentioned off. The- I mean, it's almost amazing. It's almost amazing, Stormy, that we don't have Cinderella in the tournament. Yeah. There's not a Cinderella left. I mean, if you go through it, other than Auburn on Ken Palm, the first, his first 14 ranked teams, Auburn's not there. 13 of the first 14 ranked teams are still in the tournament. I mean, that's pretty impressive. 13 of the first 14. And then the straggling three are San Diego State, Clemson, and then NC State. Yeah, it seemed like in the first round when you have Oakland beating Kentucky, hey, could this be the team that makes a run that gets to a Sweet 16? And they did force overtime with NC State, but NC State gets over the hump. And quite frankly, like DJ Burns, that big man down low, is becoming like a a cult hero too. So maybe that's the team that we're rooting for is the potential Cinderella. But even then, at at an 11 seed, it's not the the 15, it's not 14. Um, Yale upsetting Auburn was a shock, but then they get dogged by the Aztecs. So they had their moment in the opening round and then it went to the wayside. Now, I mentioned off the top, Michael, that the NFL owner meeting is going on right now in Orlando. A lot of things are being voted on and the biggest news of the day has been officially that that hip drop, drop tackle has been banned. Um, And we made the point last hour that it was a vote by unanimous decision that you said you you were talking to people very, very recently that were extremely against this. The NFLPA objected to it. We're seeing players all over Twitter that are upset about it, whether they're offensive or defensive players. So your general reaction to this being banned? Well, I mean, if the players are against it and it's for player safety, why are we doing it? If the players, I just saw J.J. Watt tweeted out how bad he thinks it is. And here's what I do think. And this is what it's on my mind and it drives me crazy, Stormy, is they put rules in under the disguise of player safety. But they don't tell the players how they're going to officiate the rules. And so now we're going to get more layers into bad officiating. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see calls that shouldn't be made that don't go with the rule. See, they don't do a good job of teaching what they don't want. This is the biggest problem. You got to, the players are smart. They're really good. They're well conditioned athletes. They know what to do. They can do things with their body that just seem strange, but they do it. And they'll understand how to adapt. Like, we don't want you to land on the quarterback. Okay, I got it. I got it. Smart players, they, they tilt their body all 350 pounds of it to the side in an instant. They adapt. But you show them what you want, they can do it. This one, I'm not sure they're showing us what they want. Because if you mentioned before, the videos that they've shown, none of them look like a drag down tackle. And so this is only going to add more confusion. It's only going to add more penalties. Because you know my man, Scott Novak. He's got that flag out, out (laughs) wherever he lives. He's dusting that bad boy off. He's going to throw that thing as sure as God made green apples. He can't wait to get that out there. Oh, I get to call one more penalty. I can't wait. Right. So, you know, he's ready to go. He's got it hoistered in there. I mean, this is Billy the Kid out there. And so, I mean, it's only going to add more confusion. And when you add more confusion and it's not player safety. Wow. Yeah, I don't. It's going to be really, really interesting to see how officials ultimately are able to enforce this, especially as this is something that was really important from the league standpoint. And so in the preseason and in those early you know, month, first four games, how is this being looked at? And the reason, because of player safety, of course, that they have given, the league study had determined that those types of drag down hits resulted in as many as 25 times more injuries than conventional tackles. But like you referenced, the video that they showed and that has been circulating online on Twitter this morning, that they showed in the room to say, this is a hip drop, this is not, some of them just look like standard tackles when you're saying that this is going to be a penalty. It's really, really going to be a challenge. And they're going to mess it up. And then they're going to have to look at it. And the coaches are going to complain Mm. because what the coaches are teachers, right? They teach the game to the players. They teach the rules of the game to the player. And if there's no clarity within the rule, 
Like you get your hand on the outside, they're going to call holding. Got it. Got to keep your hands inside. You want to hold, hold inside. Don't hold outside. Okay, got that. We'll do that. You know, can't land on the quarterback. Tilt. Don't go low on the quarterback. Here's what you got to do. Sometimes it happens. You just kind of get your body in the world. Okay, we got that. But this one, there's no teaching tape that they're going to be able to execute. Like mm-hmm. the players are going to be confused. I actually think it'll be more could be more harm to the players trying to avoid something than it will be player safety adverse. And when they sit there and try to convince us that everybody's behind it and their reaction to it is the same as my reaction, they're going to mess it up. Then it just becomes the Warren Commission. They're just Mm -hmm. feeding us lies. Yeah, again, the NFLPA objected to this. We are seeing players outwardly being against this and saying, are we just taking away football from being football? J.J. Watt, to your point, he his tweet, the exact quote is, just fast forward to the belts with the flags on them. Like, is this flag football? Is this? Are we getting one step closer to two-hand touch? Is Like, football, Michael, it's an innately dangerous sport. Like, tackling is dangerous. Blocking is dangerous. Running into people is dangerous. So it's about where do you drop the, draw the line? And this instance in particular, not having the availability to enforce it properly because it's such a subjective call is going to be really, really challenging. And so we'll see if it lasts, right? Yep. No question. And you know they're going to mess it up. You know of it course. as sure as hell. That's what the Mark NFL... Mark it down. For as good as the NFL is, it's so many things. And they're, you know, the officiating ain't so hot. Uh, we're going to hit the break here, continuing NFL talk, but turning our attention to the draft with Dane Brugler of The Athletic. Next, we still got step into my office. We still got lots more to come. This is the Lombardi Line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Stormy Bonatoni on v the sports betting network. Welcome back into the Lombardi line. Michael Lombardi and Stormy Bonantoni with you. We are exactly a month out from the NFL draft, the 89th edition coming at you. You took it all over with Dane Brugler, NFL draft analyst of The Athletic, who joins us now on the progressive guest line. Okay, things are getting real. We're a month out, Dane. How are we feeling? Hey, you know, I'm, I'm just ready for it to be here. You know, if there's so much build up to this. And it's fun talking about it because it's all about scenarios and what could happen. Uh, but yeah, hearing that it's a month away will be a lot of fun because this is this is a fun part of the calendar. You know, this is all the work's done. Now it's about finding the last little you know bits of nuggets of info. The pro days are happening right now. The thirty visits are going on where teams are bringing in different players for it could be medical reason, it could be character reasons, uh, just to get to know these guys a little bit better. And so now it's trying to look at the breadcrumbs and figure out where certain teams are leaning. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, we're almost there. And so uh, it, the, the lead up the last month will be a lot of fun. Dave, when you go through your ratings and you grade every player and you have a, a, a really good uh, player breakdown of all the top players and you write reports on all of them, what has been the one player where – you have really liked where you don't seem to think there's much traction from people inside the league. Um, I, I used to think that was Quinion Mitchell from Toledo, the corner who just had a terrific career uh, coming out of the Mac. Um, I kept getting during the season, I kept getting third round grades uh, from scouts. And I was, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm missing. This looks like a top 25 guy. But then I think what he did at the Senior Bowl, uh, what he did at the Combine, uh, running in the low four threes, I think that kind of swayed people. And now, I mean, Quinion's got a chance to be uh, one of the first defensive players drafted. So uh, it, it used to be him. Um, you know, there's a couple other corners I really like in this class. Andrew Phillips from Kentucky uh, reminds me a lot of Roger McCreary when he was coming out of Auburn, who is, is starting nickel for the Titans now. Uh, a little undersized, but he's competitive. He's got speed. And, you know, you you bet on those guys that, at, at the corner position, guys that will play their butt off uh, and also can make plays on the ball. So uh, I think Andrew Phillips is one of those guys to keep an eye on. Dane, if there's one player in this draft that has been steamed and talked about like crazy in a positive way, it's J.J. McCarthy, the way that he has climbed people's <laughs> mock drafts. And we're hearing that QBs are going to go one, two, three, four, and he might not even be available at four. Like, where do you sit on J.J. McCarthy right now? And what what is 
every other analyst that has looked at J.J. McCarthy in the past missing for him to get this type of attention? Well, it's funny because I might be the only person who is lower on McCarthy than I was in the summer. I had really high hopes for J.J. McCarthy coming into the year. Uh, in my preseason top 50 back in August, he was, I think, 19 overall. So uh, there was buzz about J.J. McCarthy even before this season. And I don't, I just, he didn't put enough body of work on the film uh, for me to give him more than, you know, say a second round grade. But I understand how teams could be optimistic about how, what he could be in the future. Uh, you know, Michigan played for an offense that didn't ask him to you know, just put everything on his shoulder and go down and make plays. Uh, but I'm encouraged by several parts of his game. You look at uh, his success rate on money down. He had a 48% completion on pass attempts on third or fourth down uh, that resulted in a first down. So he was very successful when it really counted. It didn't matter late in games. It didn't matter first quarter. He showed up when it was a got to have it type of play. And this is a guy that I, I know fans kind of roll their eyes about the win loss record for quarterbacks, but teams care about that kind of thing. And you go back to high school, 36 and two as a high school starter, won a state championship, 27 and one as a college starter, won a national championship. And so the intangible factor is something that's going to be a, a, that's a huge factor for him going early in this draft. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a good chance we see all four of these quarterbacks off the board somewhere in the first six or seven picks. And if it's the Vikings, maybe going up to four with the Cardinals, uh, you know, we, we saw the Cardinals last year trade out of the top 10, then back into the top 10. That's something we could see them maybe do again for one of these receivers. Uh, but if a team like the Vikings or the Broncos moves up for J.J. McCarthy, it's a big risk. There's no doubt about it. But I, I can at least understand where they see the optimism with the player. And where are you on Bo Nix? There's a little bit of a conflict. A lot of people think Bo Nix will be a top 12 pick in the draft. Uh, and there's conversations that teams that run West Coast really like him. He's gotten a lot of attention. Where are you on him? I, I'm not as high as others, but, I, again, I can understand the thinking with him. I mean, this year for Oregon, he completed at least 71% of his passes in every single game, all 14 games. That, that's not easy to do. Now, I think that offense was very simplistic. They set it up in a way where it was easy for him to make the reads, a lot of screens, a lot of dump offs, and then, you know, try to hit him over the top to Troy Franklin. So, you know, there's a lot to like about Bo Nix. Uh, another guy where the intelligence, I mean, I've heard a lot of good uh, character reviews in terms of his interviews and how he presents to teams, uh, just his intelligence. of, And he's a fifth year starter, you know, two years or three years in the SEC, then two years at Oregon. Um, and, and two years in, with two different offensive coordinators uh, with the Ducks. And so I think that's something that teams are going to really like the person. And then they're going to look at the tape and say, okay, you know, it's, there's not a lot of bad tape out there. It's just, okay, do you think Bo Nix can be a top 12 to 15 quarterback in the NFL? That, that's where I'm skeptical because if you don't think that, then you can't draft him uh, in the top 20 or even really in the first round. So if you're convinced he can become a top 12 to 15 quarterback, I get it. But for me, I just I have a hard time thinking he's going to get there. Dane Brugler, NFL draft analyst of The Athletic, joining us on the progressive guest line. Where do you sit on Marvin Harrison Jr.? Is he a can't miss prospect as the first non quarterback off the board? Or could a Malik neighbors or one of those other names potentially be that guy? I think the biggest misnomer with the, the, the draft is the word consensus. There, there's just no such thing as consensus. Uh, and it doesn't matter the position. Could be quarterbacks, could be receivers. And I think we've been talking about Marvin Harrison for so long as being that wide receiver one that it just was implanted in a lot of people's minds. But the reality is some teams believe Malik Neighbors could be that first receiver drafted. And so it just comes down to preference. Uh, what you prefer at the position. Malik Neighbors has a little bit more juice, especially after the catch. Um, he's younger. He still doesn't turn 21 until the summer. Uh, and he led the SEC in receiving the last two years. These are two really good players, and it just comes down to preference. But, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr., I don't think the him choosing not to work out, uh, while not ideal, I don't think that's going to necessarily factor into a team's decision about who to draft. 
because uh, let's remember, Blake Neighbors hasn't even worked out yet. Uh, he, he chose not to work out at the Combine, and we expect him to see him at the LSU Pro Day, but that has not happened yet. But I think the bottom line is, regardless, these two guys project as wide receiver ones. I'll never use the words can't miss because it's just there's, there's no upside to using that word. Uh, but I think these two guys project as potential number one receivers and two of the best players in the draft who should be off the board uh, somewhere in the first six picks. Dane, you mentioned the LSU workout hasn't happened. What do you think Jaden Daniels will weigh and who is your number two quarterback in the order after Caleb Johnson? Yeah, Drake May to me is still that number two quarterback in the draft. Um, you know, I give Jaden Daniels a, a lot of credit for uh, the, all the ground he has made up and the improvements he has made. But, I mean, we have to remember, too, Jaden Daniels is, a, is 50 years a starter. Uh, he's two years older than Drake May. If uh, Jaden Daniels came out after his third year at Arizona State, he would have been a six-round pick. So, I mean, he it, it, to have that advantage, I think, is important context between uh, when you're comparing these two guys. Um, and with Jaden Daniels, I, I think he – scouts in the spring weighed him at 205. And so I think the magic number for Jaden Daniels would be to get at least over 210. Can he be 210, 212? I think it'll be like a Bryce Young situation where he'll get that weight and then his playing weight will probably be back down closer to 205. But if he can you know, get it on the record that he's 212, then he'll be in good shape. I think the biggest thing with him is just he needs to prove that he can handle pressure at the NFL level. I mean, you watch that tape and – yeah, he, it looks great, but he's throwing to two first-round receivers, two other receivers that will be drafted next year. And it was about 50-50. When he had to drop his eyes, he was more likely to take off and run than find those second-chance throws. And in the NFL, it, that's just not going to fly. You have to be able to move the pocket and still find the open man. And just the, the lack of durability. Not, I mean, I guess he has been durable, but the lack of build is going to lead to durability concerns with the way he runs the football he doesn't need to prove how tough he is on every run. And it feels like that's what he's trying to do. But in the NFL, it's going to be more about body preservation than anything for him. But no doubt he's going to be off the board pretty early. Dane, we so appreciate your time. We, we ran out of time before the break. Otherwise, I would have asked you to look ahead to 2025 because Deion Sanders had some very pointed comments looking ahead to that <laughs> trap. Uh, thank you so much and enjoy this next month. Thanks, Dane. Anytime. Appreciate it. Thanks, Great guys. job. Dane Brugler at DP Brugler on Twitter. We're going to hit the break here when we come back. Step into Michael's office, will you please? This is the Lombardi Line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Stormy Bonatoni, on VSIN, the sports betting network. Start betting smarter with a VSIN Pro subscription. Sign up on a VSIN Pro annual subscription today. You'll get your first year for only $199 instead of our usual $240 price, but you need to use our promo code Lombardi. That gets you pro access to everything we do for the entire year, which includes our daily best bets with the leaderboard to see which VSIN expert has the hot hand. Betting splits to show you where the money and bets are moving for every game. Betting systems, premium analysis, 24-7 video access, plus our March Madness betting hub with picks for each and every game of the tournament as the bracket goes on. Remember, use that promo code Lombardi, your first year of VEASAN Pro Access for $199. You can sign up at vsin.com slash subscribe. The appointments are lined up. You waiting for somebody in there? Got an appointment. And it's not about what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. It's not personal. It's strictly business time. You and me at a private talk when you step into my office. And step into my office with Michael Lombardi. Mr. Lombardi, we'll see you now. All right, Michael. Coach Cal stepping into the office here first. Head coach of the University of Kentucky wow. basketball. Wow. The Wildcats. Lose in the first round again, upset by a 14 seed in the Oakland Golden Grizzlies. This is a Kentucky team, Michael, that now has just one NCAA tournament win in the last four years. Jay Wright said this past week after the loss that Cal has done the best he can getting future NBA players, but NIL is changing the landscape of college basketball. What's next for Coach Cal after 15 seasons in Kentucky? Well, I hear Coach Cal, Coach, I hear you talk, right? And I hear you 
quote that you've got so many lottery picks and so many guys in the NBA, and that is a wonderful achievement. I think that's remarkable, the talent that has come through Lexington, Kentucky. However, winning is all that really matters. Mm -hmm. It's not furnishing the NBA. You're not a G League team. You're a true championship-level caliber team that goes back to some of the great coaches. It goes to Adolf Ruff and all those people that have built this program. And so I think it's going to take a little bit of time to figure out what you need to do to change. And I think this happens to every coach, right? After the New England Patriots lost to the Denver Broncos in 2013 in a game where that wasn't really close, the Patriots had a, a good season, got to the AFC Championship game, but it was defeated by Peyton Manning, giving up 507 yards in that game offensively. Belichick had to make a decision. What do I do? And he started from that point forward how to alter the team. He no longer realized he could outscore teams, even with Tom Brady. They finished third those eight years in scoring. They were never lower than eighth overall in scoring. But he had to change his approach. And I think you got to change your approach because – you're getting beat, not because you don't have the most talent, because you don't have a team that can play together. And one of the things we love about the NC2A tournament, Coach, is we love flow. And flow can only happen when you get a bunch of players who want to learn and grow and have experience. And I think that's what Jay Wright was saying, that the older teams are always going to beat you because not because they're t more talented, but because they can create flow. They've been coached for five years. They do all the detail things right. Meanwhile, you got guys out there that have talent, that can do unique things, but they have a hard time doing it for 40 minutes consistently. So you're either going to continue down this path or you're going to have to change your approach. You're going to have to get your team older. And I think it's hard. And I think it's really a tough spot to be in because coaching incredibly talented players is challenging. Eric Musselman had the best recruiting class two years ago, and that struggled to win games. Eventually, they got to the Elite Eight, but it's hard. And I think you got to change your method of methodology of how you want to play and win because you haven't been to a Final Four in forever. Yeah. And you've got great PR, but you're lucky you have that PR because most people would be coming after you. John Calipari's first 10 years at Kentucky, seven Elite Eights, four Final Fours, and that national championship most recently coming in 2012. His last four years, just a single NCAA tournament win. Let's go to the NFL and Drake May, who has been perceived as, through the early draft process, one of the early quote-unquote fallers. Despite the noise, though, Michael, May is still an odds-on favorite to be selected with the number three overall pick in the 2024 draft. What should he be focusing on leading up to that April 25th date? Well, he can't control where he gets picked. He can only control his work habits. And I think the one thing Drake has going for him, and Dane Bugler mentioned this in the last block, he's a young player. And he's six feet four. He's 240 pounds. He's a big man. And he's going to get bigger and he's going to get stronger. And that weight room is going to be his best friend. And there's a lot of things to like about Drake May. And there's some concerns about Drake May. And I think what we've learned from the Josh Allen experiment is the things that you like about that you can't coach. Remember, the great buddy Ryan had this wonderful saying. He said, you know, there's a place in football for the little man. It's just not in front of the big man. And Drake May's a big man. And that helps him. And that's going to offset some of the things that he doesn't do really well, which is what Josh Allen's been able to accomplish. He's hard to tackle. He's hard to get on the ground. He can throw the ball all over. I think for Drake May, the only thing he can control is his work habits, his routine, and block out the noise. He's going to have an NFL career. He's going to go to a team that wants him. There's no question. Nobody's going to just turn the card in happenstance. He's not going through the first round like Will Levis where nobody believes in him. He's got fans out there. All it takes is one, and then he can launch his NFL career moving forward. Again, minus 135, the number for him to be that number three overall pick. The New England Patriots in that spot right now. How about Shohei Otani as he comes into the office here, Michael? It has been a very interesting Ooh. past week for him. We need the interpreter? I can't speak, <laughs> I can't speak Japanese. <laughs> well, he has a new interpreter. Look at Bill AD over here. I bet he can. I bet Bill AD can. You know, he learned that at Northwestern, I bet. Yeah. I, I, I would not believe like I would believe it when it comes to Bill 80 he gets all the tools in the toolbox but Shohei Otani we know all of the things that have been surrounding him in this gambling controversy with his former interpreter best friend 
He is a very media averse person, but Shohei Otani with a new interpreter is going to address the media later today at 545 Eastern. What will be important for his messaging to come across today, given the impact of what his interpreter is being accused of right now and the story, all the different directions that it has gone? I, I think what he has to be is, is brutally honest and explain exactly how somebody could take four and a half million dollars out of your bank account and you don't know anything about it and how you didn't see what was going on because everybody is suspicious. And so there's no sense in trying to skirt the issue. There's no sense in trying to hide behind anything. Come out and, and, and say exactly what you believe to be the truth and say it forcefully and say it dynamically so that you have people that understand what you're talking about. Because if there's a little bit of gray, if there's a little bit of uncertainty in your voice, in your delivery, people are going to think that you were involved with this. And, you know, that's and you claim you're not. And so you're going to have to make sure people understand how this strange event could happen, that an interpreter can walk away with four and a half million dollars and you had nothing else within your compound to protect yourself. Is this just stupidity on your part or is just just your business handlers didn't do a good job? I think you've got a lot of explaining to do in that area. And I think it's got to happen. The other thing I think that's very clear is because some states don't have legalized gambling, you know, we're getting this confused a little bit here. If California would have had it, there would have been a record of who made the bets, who did what. Right. But now we're in this shady underground, which has always been a dark cloud on betting, which makes it look like it doesn't belong. And we all know it does because it enhances the game perfectly when done right. And if you read the Billy Walters book about it, who's a professional gambler and understanding the ethics that go into this, it's important. No question. And initially the story from Mitsuhura, his interpreter was that Otani knew about his gambling problems and was trying to help him out, didn't trust him with the funds. So he sent him directly to the bookie, I guess in this case. But then later it was come out that from the team and from Otani's lawyers that he was a victim of massive theft. So we'll see if we get some answers and we do get some truth telling from Otani later on today. Last one here, Kevin Keats, head coach of NC State Hoops, Michael. This team is in the Sweet 16. They went on a remarkable run in the ACC tournament and they keep on winning here in the big dance. What should Keats' message be to his team ahead of this weekend's game with Marquette trying to punch their ticket in the Elite Eight? Uh, I mean, Kevin's got the greatest greatest platform to talk about it, right? Because he has two teams. He has, he has two teams. He has the bad NC State team, and he's got the good NC State team. And players love to see the visuals. They love to see when they don't play well, and they love to see when they play well. And he's got to paint a picture. He's got to tell a story. He's got to create a narrative on how we got from A to B. And that journey that's got us to B can't go backwards we've got to continue along that pathway we've got to play the right way and we all know how to play the right way one of the beautiful things about connecticut basketball is they're not chasing wins they're chasing a standard of play and nc state has established their standard of play they did it in the acc tournament and they've done it in the nc2a tournament they need to continue that standard of play that's what they're going after forget about wins Forget about wins because you and I both know if you play to your standard and your standard's high, you're going to win. And proven they can beat the big dogs. Five wins in five days, knocking off North Carolina in that ACC tournament championship. Seven wins now in 11 days. They're getting six and a half points against Marquette in that 11-3 matchup. We're going to hit the break here. When we come back, we're wrapping things up because... We have NFL win totals on DraftKings, ladies and gentlemen. Too high, too low, or just right with Gridiron Goldilocks next. This is the Lombardi Line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Stormy Bonatoni, on VSEN, the sports betting network. There's never been a better time to have skin in the game with DraftKings Sportsbook because right now we have a VSIN exclusive offer for new DK customers. Earn a $500 bonus bet for every $1,000 you wager, up to $2,500 in bonus bets your first three days on DraftKings. Don't wait. Download the app now and use our code Lombardi when you sign up. That's a $500 bonus bet for every $1,000 you wager. We are back here 
on the Lombardi line. It's also important to remember with so many bottles to choose from, it's easy to find your favorite. All the lowest prices for over 30 years. Find what you love and love what you find at Total Wine and more. I know I do. Um, but we are back here, Michael Lombardi and Story about <laughs> Tony with you. Um, love that little add in. You got, well, you got to tell the people the truth, okay? It was a long weekend and I did hit Total Wine and more watching these tournament games and I had a great time and I'll leave it at that. But with the NFL, Michael, DraftKings has new markets out and it is awesome. We already, at March 25th, have DraftKings season win totals for all 32 teams. And so we're going to look at the highest win totals and the lowest win totals here first. And, you know, throughout the course of the week, we'll get into a number of different teams, maybe go by division, TBD, how we're going to play all that out. But let's start with these highest win totals and play another game of Gridiron Goldilocks if you think this number is too high, too low, or just right. No better place to start than with the defending Super Bowl champion Chiefs, who, despite going on a six-game run after that Christmas Day loss to the Raiders and winning the Super Bowl, only had 11 wins during the regular season. Their win total went under for the year. Their win total, again, set at 11.5 going into 2024-25. Too high, too low, or just right? I think it's too low uh, because I'm not sure. Look, I think the Chargers will get better with Jim Harbaugh. But has Denver and the Raiders improved? I love the Christian Wilkins signing. Gardner Minshew, will that make the Raiders better? Have the Raiders improved? You know, I don't know. You know, I don't know. You know, last year they were able to beat the Chiefs because the Chiefs beat themselves. The Raiders created the turnovers, scored 14 points off their own mistakes, which they corrected, okay, and moved forward. So I I don't know where the Chiefs feel the competition. Certainly Cincinnati's going to be improved and and the North is improved, but I, I, I think within their division, I, I got a hard time thinking they're not going to win 12 games, Stormy. Yeah. Well, and to your point about the Broncos, they're on the list of the lowest win totals that have been announced here right now after an eight-win season. But Russell Wilson, of course, moving on and a number of question marks on that roster. Their win total set at five and a half. It's juiced at minus 140 to the over, though. Too high, too low, or just right? Five and a half for the Broncos. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, I, I got to think that's too low because, I, you know, the one thing I, I respect about Sean Payton is his ability to kind of navigate the season. I mean, thinking about it, you know, you give up 70 down in uh, Miami and you come back and go into Buffalo and win the game. Uh, it's not just always going to be about the quarter. I feel like they're going to get a quarterback whether it's J.J. McCarthy, whether it's Bo Nix, whether it's Drake May. I don't know who it's going to be, but he'll be well coached and he'll be ready to play. And winning six games, I don't think it's that hard for a guy who's been in the league long enough to do it. Now, look, Belichick couldn't do it last year, but clearly as bad as the Patriots played, again, if they would have had a kicker that could make a kick and a quarterback who wasn't just prone to turnovers, they win seven easily. Okay. Uh, Let's stick in the AFC, the Baltimore Ravens, another one of those uh, um, among the highest win totals available. The Chiefs, Ravens, and 49ers all at 11 and a half. Let's stick with Baltimore, who didn't lose a whole lot, but they did lose their defensive coordinator and Mike McDonald, which is significant. They bring in Derrick Henry on offense. They led all teams in wins a season to go with 13. That win total again, 11 and a half, juiced minus 135 to the under. Do you agree with that? Is it too high, too low, or just right? No, I, I think this is perfectly placed, and I, and I think the juice is perfectly placed as well. Because when you go through it, Gus Edwards, Devin Drune, Geno Smith, Ronald Darby, John Simpson, Patrick Queen, Morgan Moses, Tyson Bowser, you know, Desh- Deshaun Phillips, Tyler Huntley, Kevin Zeitler. You know, they didn't add anybody. They added Derrick Henry, Chris Board, a special teams player, and Josh Jacobs, a backup tackle. Like, this team really is going to count on a lot of their young players to have to come through. And they're going to count on a very young defensive coordinator, uh, Zach Orr, to come through, who's only been coaching for three years, Stormy. So I I find this one a little bit more challenging. I love the Henry signing for them. They've got to replace offensive linemen. I just think, to me, 11 would be a good year for Baltimore. And the AFC certainly more of a bear than the NFC, which let's go to the reigning NFC champs in the San Francisco 49ers. Their win total set at 11 and a half. They had 12 wins last year. Uh, too high, too low, or just right? I think this is a probably probably a little too high. I, I think 11 is the number. I'd lean towards them. They have had a lot of losses as well, right? And so... 
we, we know they're going through this whole conversation with Brandon Ayuk, who's entering into a contract, who's, who's got the fifth year. But to me, you know, they're going to have to prove that the signing of Gross Matos, the signing of Leonard Floyd, the signing of Malik, the trading for Malik Collins is going to make the strength of their team, the defensive front, strong. And I, I have no doubt they'll be moving the football offensively. They've got, you know, Kyle Shanahan and Ken. They're going to add players to the draft. But for me, I think this, because of the competition from the Rams, because I think Seattle will be improved, I just think it could knock off a win. Again, when you say they could go under, that doesn't mean they're not going to win a Super Bowl or compete. You know, sometimes your losses help you get to that point. Just ask Kansas City. Yeah, sure. And they were favored in every single game this past season, had five losses. It it happens. They went through a rough stretch the back end of the year. Um, they didn't need to be in a position to play their starters that last game, which ended up being a loss to the Ra- to the Rams, which is why they made themselves a playoff team last year. And now they're going to have to play a first place schedule again coming out of the NFC West. So all of those points well taken. The juice to the under on that minus 150. Let's go back to some of these lower win totals that are available right now and the uh, Carolina Panthers to the surprise of no one at among the lowest set at four and a half minus 115 to the over minus 105 to the under but excuse me minus 125 to the over plus 105 to the over to the under oh my gosh I'm all over the place you can see it on your screen you got it but Carolina too high too low or just right with a new coaching staff and some bolstered offensive linemen uh- I well, I I, I think this number is probably still too high. Are, are they going to be Aww. any good defensively? I think this so it remains to be seen. I know, I know. Chris is you know he's a <laughs> fan, but look, he, even even Luke Luke Combs is worried about his own team. He roots for him, you know. So I I just I I haven't been wowed by them, and I think there's been a lot of changes to their team. I think to me they're they're not as good defensively as they were, and that was what was the strength. I mean, they beat Atlanta in a rainstorm, but it's it's going to take a lot of work. And they've added names to their team. I don't know if they've added a lot of talent to their team. Yeah, there's not a lot of reason to believe that there's going to be upside for this Carolina Panthers team, at least not yet. And still, the jury's out on Bryce Young because we didn't really get the opportunity to see what he would be able to exactly. do last year. Uh, another four and a half win total, the New England Patriots. So th- these were the odds, by the way, juice wise that I was looking at before and it confused me visually. Maybe I had a dyslexic moment, but the Patriots minus 115 to go over four and a half minus 105 to go under year one under Gerard Mayo, a quarterback situation to be determined. Um, what do you think here? Too high, too low, just right. No, I think they're good enough on defense. They should get – I mean, they should have had seven wins last year. And I think with Jacoby Brissett is by far a better quarterback for them than either guy they had last year, Bailey Zappi or Mac Jones. So they're going to improve there. they got to get their offensive line fixed, which I think can improve with a new coach and, and get that straightened out. And then when you look at their, their defense, they sent a lot of their guys back. So, Look, and then if they can kick correct the kicking situation, they've got a hell of an opportunity. So I would play the over here. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not in love with their team. I think they've got a hit with the quarterback. But knowing that they signed Brissett on a one-year deal tells me they're going to draft a quarterback and redshirt him for a period of time before they go to him. Yeah, the number of games that the Patriots lost last year, giving up only 10 points or 17 points, was was pretty remarkable. And yet, yeah, Jacoby Brissett on the roster and, of course, having that number three overall pick in the draft, likely to pick a quarterback, but TBD. Last one here, the Tennessee Titans, another situation with a new coaching staff coming in. Their win total set at 5.5, plus 115 to the over, minus 140 to go under that 5.5 number. Well, I think they've gotten better. There's no question. And and I think with Bill Callahan coaching the offensive line, Will Levis uh, is going to have to take a giant step. I lean over here. I think they could get to six wins. Obviously, it's a low threshold. I don't love their team, but I think the addition of Snead at, in the secondary, they've improved their defense a little bit there. I think that helps. Uh, they've improved their secondary tremendously. They've put money in that. They're going to draft an off, another offensive lineman. Whether Pollard's 100% healthy, I don't know. But I think they've made enough moves to improve themselves uh, in that division. You know, if Vrabel were still coaching the team, I'd say it's easy. But ask yourself this question. If Vrabel was still coaching the team, what do you think Vegas would have set their win total at? 
I have a feeling it would be higher than five and a half. I'm just going to throw that out there. But uh, Yes, I do too. Yes, I do too. You're so smart. Yes. <laughs> we will continue to evaluate the remaining NFL win totals throughout the course of the week. Lots more coming out of NFL owner meetings as well. Uh, stay with us throughout the week. We'll be back here same time, same place. But for now, it's Sharp Money and Patrick Maher coming up next.